Good morning, everybody. I'm Maren Lead at CSIS, and it's a real honor to have this morning Vice Admiral Jan Tai. Um, if you were going to look up superstar in the dictionary <laughs> or overachiever, her picture would be there. Um, she's a graduate of the Naval Academy. She has a master's in applied math, a PhD in electrical engineering from the postgraduate school. Uh, she is a graduate of the Defense Language Institute, uh, studied Russian. She um, began her career as a cryptologist and then, which became uh, an information warfare specialist um, and is now the uh, commander of uh, Fleet Forces Cyber and t the Navy's 10th Fleet. Uh, she's about six months into that position. She has served at um, multiple senior levels in all, across the cyber space enterprise um, and, and both at the joint uh, level at, at Cyber Command and within uh, various Navy commands. Um, and also, uh, as her academic credentials um, are uh, prepare, well prepared her for in, on the uh, institutional side as the uh, interim president of the Naval Postgraduate School. So she has graciously agreed to come talk a little bit about what Fleet Forces Cyber and 10th Fleet uh, are, how they are evolving and where they're headed in the future, and then we'll engage in a conversation with you. So if people could turn off the ringers on their phones, we would appreciate it. And when we get to the question and answer period, if you would uh, raise your hands and we'll come around with a mic, and if you could briefly identify yourself and be succinct, we would appreciate it. Um, again, thanks for coming, and okay. Admiral Tai, over to you. All right, thank you very much. Well, thanks for coming out in this treacherous weather. Hopefully it'll be, it'll be worth your <laughs> time and effort and danger to get here. Um, I thought I would give you a little bit of the Navy perspective today on how we are approaching principally the cyberspace problem um, and why would the Navy perspective be different than the Army perspective or the Marine Corps perspective or um, the U.S. Cybercom perspective. You know, largely our perspective is not different. You know, you've heard Admiral Rogers talk about um, cyber being a team sport. Well, that is in incredibly true. On a daily basis, we're collaborating across the DOD um, with our interagency partners and even with um, corporate um, security firms on how to best um, operate and defend uh, the networks, the DOD networks, the Navy networks. Um, we're sharing lessons learned, particularly across the other services. Um, we are learning from each other. We're training to a joint standard. Um, but at the same time, we recognize that principally with cyberspace, we all tend to approach it from our service perspective. Um, Navy freedom of action in cyberspace is necessary to accomplish all missions that the Navy is expected to accomplish on behalf of the United States. Winning wars, deterring aggression, freedom of the seas. And so our ability as a Navy to bring capability to the Department of Defense, to the COCOMs, is critically linked um, to our cyberspace capabilities. And so each of the services recognize those dependencies. And as we evolve our capability and our ability to operate and defend in cyberspace, um, understanding what the synergies are with other missions across um, our services and with DOD is, is an incredibly important optic to have uh, as we're moving forward. So just to describe a little bit about how the Navy thinks about cyber, um, put it in the larger context of information dominance. Um, beginning around the 2009 timeframe, we began to organize and resource and acquire things through the lens of information dominance, bringing information capabilities together. So what is traditionally an, a two um, type of a portfolio, if you start at you know, the Echelon 1, the OpNav, the CNO staff, we've brought the N2 um, organization, intelligence type, all types of intelligence, 
um, together with the six organization, which is communications and signals and cyber. And we brought in um, some other capabilities that were linked in with various platform type sponsors, submarine air uh, surface platforms that were data links that were about bringing information together um, to create um, the N2 and 6, which is a single organization at the OpNav level. Um, and the next step in that evolution was the establishment of Fleet Cyber Command as the operational commander um, for, for networks, cryptology, electronic warfare, um, cyber, EW, and space. Um, most recently, sort of in our evolution of how we're embracing information dominance and, and cyber, uh, as a part of that is um, we've created what we call a type commander in the Navy. So this is um, you know, what all of the other war fighting areas in the Navy have to focus on generating readiness for surface warfare, for example, or for air warfare, or for submarine warfare. So we have type commanders that generate readiness and flow that readiness to operational commanders. And so we're beginning to you know, organize our cyberspace capabilities and the larger information dominance, it's not all cyber, uh, the larger information dominance capabilities um, in the same way that the Navy organizes all of its other warfighting capabilities. Um, we think about information dominance across three pillars, um, assured command and control. Clearly, that's important to the Navy as we operate in peacetime and war, wartime forward. Our ability to command and control and communicate with um, our, our platforms at sea is critically important. And so um, assuring that Navy command and control is incredibly important. We've got to bring battle space awareness to commanders in the Navy forward. So that is operating intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance capabilities that are within the Navy, leveraging capabilities across the other services in our national agencies, and bringing together the best possible information for decision makers wherever they may be uh, in terms of battle space awareness. The third pillar is integrated fires. And so from our perspective, when we think about electronic warfare, delivering non-kinetic uh, cyber warfare, de delivering a non-kinetic effect as part of a warfighting plan or campaign, that's an aspect of it. The other aspect of it is delivering kinetic effects. You've got to be able to get targeting information, you've got to be able to command and control those things, and all of that is based on the availability, integrity of our communication systems, of our uh, command and control systems, and how we interact with the launching platform and uh, the weapon. And so bringing all of those things together at the Echelon One level and thinking about that as a, from a resource sponsor perspective is how the Navy is approaching um, information dominance in general. And now we have an operational commander, and now we have a type commander. And so this is beginning to regularize how we do information dominance inside of the Navy. When you bring it down to the Fleet Cyber Command level, I'll neck it down to be um, you know, my, my responsibilities at Fleet Cyber Command and 10th Fleet, you know, responsible for Navy networks, for cryptology and SIGINT, for IO, cyber, and electronic warfare and space. So the space, the Navy portion of the space constellations that we have out there, we actually are the operators of that constellation. Um, because I have those responsibilities inside the Navy, I serve as the Navy component commander to um, US Cyber Command. I serve as the cryptologic component commander to NSA CSS. Um, I serve as the Navy component commander to STRATCOM for the operations of the space capabilities. But the key part of all of that is operations. And so um, I am viewed as the operational commander to operate um, Navy networks, communications, um, and to defend those Navy networks and communications. Not a service provider, not an enabler, not the CIO, not the policy writer, not the acquisition organization or the resource sponsor. I'm the operational commander. I'm driving all of those people. I need all of those people to be the supported commander to do their part of the job. Um, but but thinking, and, and thinking across the Navy about Fleet Cyber Command and 10th Fleet as the operational commander in this space is something that, that has been evolving over the last four years. 
Um, I also have some. I also have a supporting role to other maritime commanders or to you know, the joint commanders, um, and all operational commanders have those kinds of uh, supporting activities as well. Um, I like to think about our success as Fleet Cyber Command within my, within my domain. Um, we are trying to get to a place where we can measure our success based on basically five high-level goals, and figuring out how to exactly measure this is, uh, is something that um, we're, we're refining as we go. But the first one and most important is um, being able to operate the Navy network as a warfighting platform. Um, that includes our fleet communications, actually, our, our space assets, and, and our networks all, all together, because I have responsibility across all of those. Those have to be available, and they have to be secure. So we have to, we have to juxtapose those two things. How available are the networks to anybody who needs to be able to use them, and how confident are we that there are no malicious actors in there, or that the data in there is what we expected the data to be, or that the communications flowing from those networks are, are what we expect. And so operating the Navy networks as a warfighting platform is a principal goal that we're gonna be, begin to measure, that we will measure ourselves and create strategies around um, continually improving our game in that space. Um, the second is under my SIGINT and Cryptologic hat. We provide um, SIGINT to both maritime supported commanders directly. We provide um, SIGINT packages, capabilities, and people to embed within our forward operating forces. And then we provide people to the National Security Agency, the Navy part of the National Security Agency Central Security Service, um, to conduct their national foreign intelligence mission. Um, third goal is um, that we'll measure ourselves is um, being able to deliver effects in supporting war, in support of warfighting objectives. And so again, that, that hits back on our electronic warfare requirements, information operations, and cyber. Um, I have a role as the Navy component commander at US Cybercom as the Joint Force Headquarters Cyber, whereby I will um, represent US Cyber Command to combatant commanders um, to oversee cyber operations on behalf of those combatant commanders and create capabilities that can be integrated in to their warfighting plans and their capabilities. And so we're gonna measure our, our, the goodness of our ability to deliver, deliver warfighting effects in that. And then finally, the last piece, it's kind of inherent in the first goal, but um, being able to create situational awareness whereby I can make um, good decisions about how we maneuver Navy networks, um, whereby I can share situational awareness, the cyber situational awareness, with, with supported commanders as well, so that they know um, if, when they're trying to accomplish their mission, how secure, how available, how do we fight through if there's adversaries out there uh, on the network um, to accomplish their missions as well. Uh, so being able to share with our partners uh, across the Navy with U.S. Cyber Command and the other services, information about, about our networks is um, going to be critical, is critically important to our success as a DOD. So, you know, whether we like it or not, cyberspace is an established operational warfighting domain. And just like the maritime and air and space uh, domains, this domain has to be defended, and through this domain, we will uh, deliver those warfighting effects against adversaries that wish to do our nation or our allies harm. Um, the threat in cyberspace is, um, you know, evolving on a near daily basis. Um, arguably, cyberspace has profoundly changed the way that we live our lives, the way that we conduct warfare, the way that we do business. Uh, it's presented opportunities for goodness and it's presented opportunities for those um, with you know, less than good intent, malicious intent, criminals. Um, the scope of the problem runs from, you know, when we think about it, we have everything from criminals to hacktivists to nation states um, conducting espionage uh, in support of their own national interests um, to, um, 
people conducting destructive or disruptive uh, attacks to express displeasure or to um, have a um, debilitating effect on some company or some nation or some set of actors. All of those different types of problems come from different types of motivation. Some of it is clearly profit driven. Some of it is trying to gain a competitive advantage, um, both from an industrial perspective or from a war fighting perspective. Um, being able to take um, data about uh, capabilities that have been developed or, or intellectual property that has been developed um, and take it to instantly uh, delivering um, capabilities without all of the research and development that has needed to go in um, gives, gives a competitive advantage without having to put all of the work in. And so we've seen um, all kinds of different actors out there, uh, Estonia, Saudi Aramco, Razgas, um, Sony Pictures most recently. We have all types of different actors using different motivations to go in and exact their will through cyberspace. Because of the low cost of entry, um, we don't always have an ability to attribute um, uh, particular intrusions to any particular nation state or actor. Um, it's really hard in a lot of cases to determine the intent uh, of those malicious actors when they uh, gain entry into your network. And so we tend to, within Navy networks, think of it as we have to treat those uh, attempts at intrusions or suspicious activity on our network as the most dangerous, um, which would be a destructive type attack or poising for a destructive type attack in our networks. Um, so how, we're approaching it sort of in two different dimensions uh, within the Navy. We think about those opportunities that our network presents to malicious actors as the intrusion attack surface, just like you would in a regular warfighting domain. How much opportunity do you present for malicious actors, be they criminals, be they nation states, be they hacktivists, be they somebody that just stumbled into your network because they were looking for opportunities? How much opportunity do you present uh, to, to bad actors to intrude into your network or to move laterally when you get there. And so there's a lot of people involved in reducing uh, the attack surface for Navy networks. Because um, on a daily basis, that attack surface tends to you know, grow and shrink uh, when, an, you know, when an operator gets online and clicks on a spear phishing email. Potentially introduces opportunities for malicious actors to get into our network. When we delay modernization of systems, we are delaying the upgrade of operating systems, which means it's very difficult to defend in old operating systems against new zero-day activities. When the new zero days come out on any given day, and it seems to be every given day these days, um, suddenly your attack surface has grown um, wherever you happen to have that that vulnerability throughout the Navy network. And so taking actions to crunch down that attack surface to be as small as possible, it's not gonna go to zero. Even if you had it perfectly, everything patched, um, every operator understanding the, the nature of his, his or her behavior online, um, you know, Every day, a new vulnerability potentially is going to be found. And so we recognize that there's going to be an attack surface. Let's try to make it as small as possible. And we have a lot of opportunities and, and people working on that across our systems command, across the OpNav staff, across our type commander. Um, make that attack surface as small as possible. And then we have the layered defense in depth. Uh, that runs from the boundary of our internet all the way down to an individual computer inside of Navy networks. And that, that defense in depth depends upon those first couple of layers, US Cyber Command and DISA are involved in defending, uh, and then we get down to the Navy boundary, and we have um, sensors and countermeasures uh, that, that are witting of potential um, 
types of attacks and threat vectors that we've configured um, to prevent intrusions into our network or detect intrusions into our network um, and detect movement inside of our network. And so we're using, basically we think of it like in ISR, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. We use intelligence to track uh, the threat actors that are out there and inform how we maneuver our network or how we arm our defenses against those threats. And then we do surveillance inside of our networks using sensors um, to, to um, detect or try to prevent uh, any kinds of intrusions or, or malicious activity on our network. And then finally, we have um, people that go hunt. They go hunting in our networks, you know, because if the passive sensors don't, uh, don't do the trick, we need to have people go out and verify and look for um, bad actors in new and different ways. And so that is sort of the approach that we're taking, and we have quite a few uh, initiatives across the Navy that, that get after those, those types of changes, both cultural, educational, changes to how we do uh, acquisition, how we do requirements, how we plan and program for the cyber threat that is unknown in the future, but we know it's gonna be there. Um, and so we have, we have lots of initiatives uh, ongoing. You've probably heard about Task Force Cyber Awakening. Um, there was a few articles on that uh, a few weeks ago and that's getting after how we make investment decisions and what are the right processes by which we deal with future cyber threats within our system. And so with that, we are focused on the Navy network, the security of the Navy network, the integrity of the Navy network, but we also know that that kind of focus is not sufficient to protect all the Navy um, interests in cyberspace. Um, one, of our, one of our great problems also revolves around the loss of data that is of value to Navy inside of our defense industrial base. Um, uh, you know, on a ru fairly routine brace basis, uh, we are losing you know, great uh, intellectual property and important data to the Navy out of uh, the commercial sector of the defense industrial base. And so that becomes a problem because our warfighting advantage, when those types of unclassified but sensitive information that lives um, in, in the defense industrial base unclassified networks is, is, is given to people that you know, it was not intended for. And so you know, it can reduce our warfighting advantage um, in future conflict. It can um, result in uh, operational security lapses and losses. Um, in terms of how we operate in the Navy, where we're going or what we're doing. Um, and it can greatly accelerate uh, potential future adversaries' capabilities um, if they can just take what we are building and, and build it themselves. And so we are working uh, with law enforcement, FBI, and our NCIS and, and U.S. Cyber Command um, to try to get after better sharing of information um, and try to get to a place where, you know, today we're in a reactive mode. So we find out about it after, after someone has broken in. Um, law enforcement or NCIS goes out and takes a look at what was taken. We do forensics on what was taken. We do a risk assessment on what it means to the Navy. Um, but, you know, that's where our cybersecurity sort of started out within DOD you know, 10 years ago. We were reacting to intrusions. We need to get the rest of the, uh, of the defense industrial base to a place where we're more proactive, where, you know, if there are suspicious activity in those, in those networks that our um, defense industrial partners have an opportunity and ability to do something about it be before it becomes a loss. And so getting to better sharing in real time, sharing is something that is really important to us. Uh, that is true for you know, the United States Navy and their defense industrial based partners, but it's as equally true um, with the rest of government in terms of bringing the power of all the information and our uh, sensor information together and, and having the, you know, the entire government benefit from 
the information that we have, the responses that we could generate for that. So with that, I think I will throw it open to questions. OK, great. Right. Thanks. I mean, that was a, covered a lot of waterfronts. Oh, I really appreciate yeah. it. I'm sorry. Um, so let me start with two quick questions, if I could. Um, you talked about utilizing and the evolution of uh, information dominance as a, as a war fighting function in every sense and, mm -hmm. and the institutionalization of that and the delivery of integrated fires uh, in particular. Um, recent joint doctrine has emphasized cross-domain synergies and clearly the delivery of integrated fires and cyberspace's role in that addresses affecting uh, cross-domain from cyberspace to other domains. How, how would you characterize, how far along are we conceptually in um, having, thinking about the other domains uh, delivering effects into cyberspace in ways that, that help uh, really realize those synergies? I mean, how, how much potential is there and have we realized it? Yeah, I, if, I, if I understand your question correctly, I think we're at, we're still at the beginning. I mean, um, being able to integrate the the cyber aspects of, um, you know, how you would project power and defend your own capabilities into the overall combatant commander warfighting clans. I mean, that's what combatant commanders do. They bring the capabilities of the army and the navy and the air force and. Um, sometimes the Coast Guard and, and special operations, they bring it together and, and, and you know, achieve effects with the integrated application of, of those capabilities. And so um, when it comes to integrating um, cyberspace in, we have been exercising it, you know, to some extent right. in the abstract, right? right? <laughs> to some extent in the abstract, we've been exercising both the defense uh, of cyberspace for the warfighter and their ability to project power or to achieve some effect that either couldn't be achieved or we don't want to achieve with a kinetic effect. Does that, does that get well, at your question? I, I, I didn't ask the question very okay. well. I, okay. to, if, if, I think we have made a lot of progress in thinking about how to deliver effects through cyberspace mm -hmm. in support of operations on land and in the sea mm -hmm. and in the air. Mm -hmm. um, have, have we fully fleshed out thinking about how to deliver effects from air or land or the sea to enable cyberspace operations go the other direction? Well, I, I mean, I think to some extent. Uh, in a mutually reinforcing way. I mean, is it that, is the thread woven yet um, in that regard? I don't know that we have the expertise, mm -hmm. um, you know, built right. to, to perfectly say that we've we've got it right, but I mean, in some regards, um, you've seen some of the kinet. We've used kinetic mm. against command and control, right? Right, um, and that's not really different than right. cyberspace to right. some extent. So we've you know we've gone after command and control kinetically, you know, since right. the first Forever. Gulf War right. at right. least. That's what I remember. <laughs> it's as far back as my memory goes. So you know, to some extent. We always view that as an option, and even in um, some of the exercises we've done in the last several years, we've looked at it from both perspectives. We've set, you know, we, it, from an exercise perspective, we've set it up a target as a non-kinetic, and something went wrong, and mm. we couldn't get to it. You know, it's mm. just part of the exercise. Right. What do you do right. now? Oh, let's consider hitting it kinetically. Yeah. And so we, we, we are thinking about those things together. I think as we mature and grow the force, mm. part of the cyber mission force, <clears throat> we will get better at planning in a more integrated mm -hmm. fashion and less at abstractly, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, one last question on, the, on your point about the defense industrial base and um, the evolution of that very complicated conversation um, as it extends beyond the traditional defense industrial base, sure. which uh, as we, as, as the Defense Department seeks to leverage less traditional defense suppliers, mm -hmm. particularly in your, your realm, um, how, how do we do that if it's not, I mean, it's, it's hard enough with the big defense companies that we traditionally 
do business with. And if we're trying to expand that network, so to speak, both literally and figuratively, um, how, how, how does that, how are we gonna get to that space, do you think? How do you see that conversation evolving? Well, I think um, there has, you know, for a great many years been a lot of pressure put on uh, obtaining uh, capabilities, particularly in communications and networks, for the lowest price, mm -hmm. right? So that pressure to be efficient, um, you know, from a fiscal perspective mm -hmm. is juxtaposed in some cases um, with um, being secure, mm -hmm. knowing um, where you're getting that router or that switch from at any given time, knowing that um, it's assured and that you know what's you know sort of running on it. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think we are um, we we've been talking about supply chain mm -hmm. risk management for a long time. I think we are getting um, better and better at inculcating that into um, our acquisition process in a way that um, we have to be more assured of what we're yeah, buying. Right. But but there is there will continue to be, you know, because of the pressures on the budget, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, a push on our acquisition system to get it at the lowest right. price. And the lowest price isn't always the most secure. And so this gets back to sort of that cultural um, challenge of, well, it's just IT. It, it's an administrative thing, so go get it for the cheapest price. Industry will bring it. They'll bring the innovation. You don't have to worry about that. That's one line of thinking that we've sort of been operating under, you know, in, in the past. And the other part of it is you would never buy a weapon system in this manner. No, nobody goes out and says, go, let's go buy the cheapest, you know, fill in the blank. Yeah. We study what we should be buying, what is the, within the realm of the possible with physics and technology. And we understand, you know, how capable that's going to be before we go out and buy it. And so we have to bring, we have to bring cyberspace um, more into the realm of um, thinking about it like we're acquiring a weapon system. It has to be defendable. It has to be defendable. Okay. Um, we've got, if you could wait for the mics, we'll start up here and uh, briefly identify yourselves. Let's go here, here, and then back there. Hello, Admiral. Uh, thank you very much for the forum. Uh, it was just uh, announced, I guess it hasn't been formally announced, that Ash Carter will be probably the new Secretary of Defense, and he was the chief weapons buyer. So will that be helpful to you in buying cybersecurity systems in a, in a weapons kind of mode? Uh, second part of the question was, he just had an International Sea Power Symposium. Was uh, cybersecurity a, a topic there? And how does the U.S. help our NATO allies, other allies around the world, be secure? Sure, great question. Um, you just asked if the potential future next Secretary of Defense will be helpful to me. Pending <laughs> um, confirmation. Yeah, pending confirmation. You know, certainly, um, uh, you know, over the over the last several years, he's been very involved in the discussion and the debate around um, cybersecurity, how we're building it in. Uh, he's been a, a you know a prince, a primary driver. So. Um, it's not a new conversation. Um, we, whether you're coming from the private sector or, or a different part of government or the DOD, we all are dealing with these cybersecurity problems. But you know, clearly, um, the the DOD view and how we um, continually up our game to meet the threat um, is something that he spent a lot of time, you know, in the past couple of years um, working through. So. Uh, I think I, I think that's um, you know that could be you know a very good thing for us. But as I said, we've all got different perspective. Whether you're coming from corporate from the corporate side or the DoD side, um, we have committed. We've made a choice um, to make sure that we are uh, moving forward in a way that accounts for cybersecurity in everything that we buy. And uh, you know I think that'll be great. Your second question, allies. International sea, sea power. Um, it it was a it was brought up as a topic of discussion at the International Sea Symposium, and um, you know it wasn't sort of on the agenda, um, but it was brought up as a topic of discussion and agreed to that the next uh, get together, um, not the next ISS, but the next get together in, in Singapore, um, there would be. A, 
a sort of a more focused discussion um, in terms of how we all collaborate from a maritime perspective in cyber and what the risks are. Okay, I'll go here and then back there and then look over here and back there. Hi, Lara Seligman from Inside the Navy. Um, you talked a little bit about um, how delay and modernization of systems is um, a problem for cybersecurity. So I'm wondering how this applies to ship platforms in terms of their age and limited availabilities. Um, how, how big of a problem is this for you and what are you doing to counter this? Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. I think, I, I guess, it gets back to what I was talking about with respect to risk, you know, pressure on the budget. And so a, a normal way that we you know, save money or ha if you have to find money for some other problem um, when we're building programs is to potentially you know, delay the modernization, spread it out. Um, and so, like I said, that modernization program often comes with the upgrades to operating systems. and. And, and things that are necessary from a cybersecurity perspective. But in the past, that, that we haven't had a way of really understanding or capturing or knowing how that decision to delay that's made you know, as part of the program build um, potentially has a, an effect on the cybersecurity posture of whatever that system is that depends on an operating system or a set of um, applications or, or whatever. And so, um, I think we've identified that that's, that's a, a, an issue and, and figuring out how we're gonna change sort of the requirements process, the planning, programming, budgeting, and execution, and what does sustainment look like for all types of systems, particularly shipboard systems? What does their sustainment plan look like because of restricted availability, because of um, you know, some of these systems you know, are, are, you know, may not be modernized for a very long time. And so that's part of what our task force cyber awakening is looking at. What is that process? What are the things that have to be rendered um, cyber safe to assure the mission of any particular platform or any particular uh, operating unit? Um, and so, so that's, that's, you know, exactly what we're working on. Those factors haven't um, largely been well understood in the past of, you know, sometimes decisions are made that we don't understand what the, what the long-term effects are. And sustainment of, you know, of software heavy systems, and most of them are these days, um, sustainment has to account for the fact that, you know, vulnerabilities will happen, baseline changes have to be made, and, and, and the longer it takes us to do that, the more risk that, or opportunity for the bad guys that we present out there. Um, and so, like I said, we're gonna, we're gonna try to change processes and account for those things um, at the highest level, um, but at the same time, we're gonna find ways to mitigate risk of those vulnerabilities being in there through defensive measures and situational awareness. Hi, Joe Marks from Politico. I'm wondering, first, if you can talk a little bit about how the Navy is talking about offensive cyber operations, which I know is being still in development all across the military. And then second, just on a staffing level, what does the Navy's piece of cyber mission forces look like? And are there people who are people in the Navy who are doing cyber operations on a day-to-day -day basis who aren't part of cyber mission forces? And what is that looking like? Sure. Um, so how we're talking about offense is what you first asked. Well, you know, largely we're not talking about it too much. <laughs> I mean, um, uh, everybody, everybody wants some. So I spend a lot of time um, talking to my fellow uh, number of fleet commanders and Navy component commanders, and, and they are interested in how they would integrate and how they would think about bringing <gasps> cyber operations and offensive cyber operations into their... Um, into their, you know, wheelhouse. Um, we're not in a place today where I can say, well, this is exactly how you would do it. We're building, you know, we're building the force and, and that force is um, largely aimed at uh, satisfying COCOM requirements. And so, um, you know, continuing to work with, and, and again, a lot of my work 
on, uh, on the defensive side with those other uh, component commanders to assure their missions um, is sort of that first step, building the relationship between my Maritime Operations Center and their Maritime Operations Centers, how we're going to fight through um, network issues or, or malicious actors in our network um, is sort of that first step. And we're regularizing uh, and beginning to exercise um, those kinds of operations. Um, with respect to the Navy portion of the Cyber Mission Force, um, the, the build of the Cyber Mission Force um, for the Navy looks like about 18, 1850 uh, new folks, um, and I think you asked if if we had cyber operators before we had the cyber mission force. Clearly, um, before there was a cyber mission force, we had uh, um, we have we have operators operating the network on a daily basis. System administrators, people doing patching, you know, people looking for uh, upgrading systems operating the network. We had people defending the network from a network defense perspective, monitoring um, sensors, looking for malicious activity, responding to that malicious activity. And so, you know, with that, uh, that force existed in each of the services to, some, to you know, potentially differing extents. Um, but the point that the, the DOD made the decision that that force alone was not sufficient to the threat that we need to have um, additional forces to be focused on defending the nation, to be focused on uh, integrating and delivering on the COCOM combatant commander requirements, and then finally um, additional protection and defense of DOD networks. And so this cyber mission force lays atop that foundational um, force that operated and defended the network to begin with. Um, yes, my, my, I have a Navy Cyber Defensive Operations Command that existed before and it'll continue to exist. It'll just be more synergistically applied. It'll be more capacity um, to, you know, to some extent to go out, as I suggested, and hunt for, you know, I'll have a piece of the cyber protection teams that are service oriented and, and those forces will operate in conjunction with my day-to-day -day 24 by 7 defenders, we could launch them potentially to go look at specific key cyber terrain um, for any particular mission, you know, sort of looking at it through a different lens. When I'm a supported commander, I'm looking at the Navy networks operating and defending them as a whole. I have to do that. Um, I can use my cyber protection teams to turn the lens around and go, what does the commander of um, the Sixth Fleet need to assure, so he can accomplish his mission, what is most important, let's focus on that. And so we'll send those teams to go explore, you know, sort of end to end, map it, make sure, you know, that, that the integrity and the availability and resiliency is there for, for his mission. Okay, I think um, I want to make, give some time to this side, so we'll oh. go and then we'll come back. Okay. Sorry. I was, I, I was I going to face this, this way, way too. Okay. So. <laughs> Hi, Sam Legron with USNI News. Um, can you talk a little bit about sort of the intersection between uh, 10th Fleet and some of the more traditional EW capabilities that are out there? I mean, it seems to me that there'd be, you know, they're all electrons. There should be some overlap one way or the other there. So how are you all working together? Well, largely, um, we, we are tending to be more involved in sort of the capability development, acknowledging that you know, between the RF spectrum and the cyberspace spectrum, it's really one. It's one thing, just just with different frequencies. Um, and so, in terms of capability development and understanding what we could um, create for uh, warfighters that are at sea, not executed from Fleet Cyber Command or Tenth Fleet, but actually being executed by um, other supported commanders. Um, we are in the capability development and the advocacy role. Um, we also have um, served as a sort of a uh, readiness and certifying official for those capabilities that are embedded um, in our ships at sea. And so it's more, that, that piece of it has been more of a readiness function. And we are looking at um, what makes most sense going forward. We have the information dominance type commander. And so he is a, a readiness generator. And so those forces that I have 
uh, serving for Fleet Cyber Command could be accomplishing that on his behalf and he would be um, you know, responsive to Fleet Forces Command, PAC Fleet, and, and the rest of the fleet in terms of generating that readiness and assessing uh, and certifying those folks to go to sea. I think, did you have, she, she's had her hand up in the back right for a while, so. Thank you, Anne Lilina. Admiral, could you discuss the working relationship with the other cyber units and the other forces? Is it just through U.S. Cyber Command, or do you have ad hoc working relationships or whatever you can share, Army, Marines, et cetera? Oh, no, definitely. I mean, we, it, it is a team, we talk about being a team sport. It's definitely a team sport. There are aspects to um, how we operate and defend Navy networks that, um, you know, we share and work directly with the other service components because, the, you know, their problems are more like ours than, than, you know, U.S. Cyber Command looking at it globally. We also are working incredibly closely with, um, the, with DISA. Um, in terms of creating defensive strategies um, across across the two of us, so yeah, we we work across the services directly with U.S. Cyber Command with DISA, um, and you know to some extent uh, we don't we we tend to work through U.S. Cyber Command um, with the other agencies, the DHSs, the FBI's, those kinds of things, but um, you know on any given day we may be you know collaborating with them on something specific. Uh, and using our um, NCIS um, folks as a conduit as well, um, the NCI JTF uh, team. So, so there is, you know, there is criminal investigation, there is counterintelligence, and there is cyber. And sometimes, you know, working together as a team, we can achieve what we need to across all all those different authorities. I think up here, and then uh, here, and then over here. Um, I'm a Taiwanese research fellow at the CSIS. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, my question is, uh, when we see cyberspace as a potential battleground, I think it's very inevitable to, to cooperate with the uh, private sector because uh, cyberspace has been uh, combined with several different sectors, such as military, governmental, and uh, civil society. Uh, but uh, on, the, uh, on the other hand, um, can you talk more about how military sector is able to uh, isolate or to divide into different parts with um, like a private sector when uh, national information infrastructure has been established, uh, established upon a civil society. So um, for instance, like uh, when those combating system has been established upon computer, computer system, um, how military or how naval um, sector is able to isolate mm -hmm. uh, themselves from this private day work. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, I think I can. Um, I mean, uh, you can think of it even within the civil sector as an enclave, right? You know, a set of computers that are wired together. I mean, there is a physical dimension to it. And if you build that network um, from the perspective of um, controlling what those connections are, so that they, 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 you know, to some extent, don't use the full power of the commercial infrastructure upon which they ride. They are, you know, we're the DOD. We can control this a little better than the commercial sector can. And so it has more to do with the paths through which we communicate on the network and controlling those paths and putting boundaries around the paths where we interface with the public part of the sector. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? I mean, we have limited the number of ways in which we interact um, with the public internet. And through those boundaries, we can control what comes in and what comes out. Is there any regulation talking about the separation between the military sector and the private sector? No, I think it's a choice. I think it's a choice that we've made um, for the defense of the DOD networks. Thank you, Admiral, for your talk. This is Ellen Nakashima with the Washington Post. I have two questions, one focusing on your operations overseas and the other on your operations at home. Overseas, being the Navy, do you 
have any special expertise in, um, say, the intelligence area in um, understanding the threat of particular adversaries or nation states, for instance, China or North Korea, uh, given the um, you know, regional com combatant commands that you're uh, supporting and just your, th the nature of your, your service. And can you talk about, about that a little bit, what those adversaries might be and how you, God, how, what, your, what you do with that intelligence, how you use it to support yeah, yeah. certainly we use all source intelligence, national intelligence right. capabilities, and our own intelligence capability to try to understand the threat actors that are out there, be they nation states, be they criminals, be they activists. We're going to take that information, each of us, each service, each um, agency is going to take it and configure it to what we need to be able to, to defend globally. I mean, yes, there are regional actors. And they may have specific uh, intent in a certain region, but but there's nothing to bound them to that region, right? right. So so we are defending more globally against those threats. Um, I, I guess I, I was saying, vis-a-vis -vis the army or other services, would you have any particular um, expertise into a particular? Adversary. No, I mean, we operate globally. I've got to be able to respond to and configure my defenses against, you know, everything from the criminal actor to specific um, hacktivists or whatever. And, and are so, you so we're not, we're, you know, we haven't sort of subdivided the threat actors into different services. Okay, you guys worry about them and you worry, no. We, because we are operating forward in, in, in especially with the Navy, you know, we're, we're out there to, uh, and our allies are very assured by us being out there, but you know, but other people don't necessarily like us being out there. And so we tend to be in the face of people whether they like it or not, but it's freedom of the seas. And um, so that potentially draws fire uh, you know, against us, but again, it, could be, it, it doesn't mean that it would be bound regionally. It could draw fire anywhere in the Navy if, if, if someone wanted, again, to express displeasure or or, or have an effect, a disruptive effect on the United States Navy. And then domestically, what, what is, you, you mentioned the defense industrial base, and um, I think you said you, you do uh, investigations with the FBI into defense contractors who, who might have been hacked and have um, had intelligence stolen that relates to the Navy. What, what is your role there? Yeah, you... my role is not to do the investigation. Okay. We're responding to what the either FBI or if NCIS yeah. goes in. If it's a national security system, there it triggers um, different types of investigations. We use the data um, to, first of all, defensively make sure that um, we're protected, but but understand what might have been taken, and. Um, and that's a whole nother sort of assessment of what that means to us from a capability perspective, not cyber per se, but you know any type of capability where, where data has been lost about our capabilities. What might that mean? And so if in your defend the nation role, you're called on to, to take some form, some action to defend a uh, big company that's been attacked, what might you be able to do? Yeah, so technically Fleet Cyber Command wouldn't be called upon for the defend the nation, we have the national mission force to do that, and it you know would depend upon um, what the president authorized uh, us to do in response. And it you know it's it's going to have so many factors in terms of you know what are we what is the risk to national interests and, and national security, and and what is U.S. Cybercom authorized to do to defend those interests, and so you know it, there's probably a fairly wide range of things that could be authorized, and uh, you know, we're building the capacity and capability to be able to do it. My role in that is to provide the Navy forces to that national mission force and, and make sure that they're trained and ready to go. Ray Dubois, CSIS. Uh, Admiral, I read recently an interesting discussion about the name the domain name cybersecurity. And the author was suggesting it's really a misnomer or at least terribly inadequate, that the domain really should be described as electromagnetic spectrum. But setting that aside for the moment, are, do you have military department of the Navy responsibility, i.e. for the Marine Corps 
also, and if not, who has that, number one. Number two, do you have a precise counterpart in the Army and the Air Force with a similar role and, and responsibilities? Sure. Um, so as it pertains to um, the United States Marine Corps, um, the department, um, you know, one department, but two services. And so I have a counterpart uh, that is Mar for Cy Marine Forces Cyber um, in the Marine Corps that does the operation and defense. The other services are not all organized or aligned in the same way. Again, the Navy's approach to information dominance sort of led us down this path of, the, of, of combining the power and the synergistic effects of all things information, and particularly, you know, the intel and the signals side of the house, the communications, and thinking about those things together, not separately. And so, as a result of that, Fleet Cyber has um, the, the, the cyber responsibilities, but also, you know, the SIGIT responsibilities today, um, embedded in one commander. The other services have two. So, there, so I have two counterparts in each of the other services. I think we got time for one more question in the back, and then okay. Uh, Milt Neaton, uh, Ethan Allen Institute. Uh, historically, we've always found that the weak link is uh, uh, the human operator. Um, do you find that educating uh, the agencies and industries that you're dealing with is a major part of your program? Um, sure, I do. That's why I tend to talk about, you know, the defense industrial base. I've actually gone out and talked to others, just in the private sector, um, about the choice you make. The choice you make in investing in your own cybersecurity. And, you know, I think a lot of people feel, to some, to some extent, victimized by the state of cyber, you know, security across the nation and, and, and whether it's an individual company going, well, we don't have those kinds of resources. This is a choice. This is a choice we all have to make in terms of how important is your reputation, how important is the security of information I care about, Maybe it's my information that I gave to you to build something, but it also could be your own intellectual property that I've, you know, that I that I've, you know, helped fund or that IRAD has funded. Um, it doesn't mean that it should be available, you know, globally, and 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 multiple companies be able to then take that that development and go into production. And so, you know, we, I feel that you know having this conversation uh, is something we have to do as a as a nation to understand what is the real risk to, to our national interests. And it, it goes way beyond the DOD, but a lot of the, the effects in the private sector will have an effect on our ability to do our mission as well. And so, you know, it's not, it's not that we're better. We've been thinking about it, you know, a, perhaps a little bit longer, but the private sector is really, in terms of cybersecurity capabilities and knowledge, you know, really coming on, a lot to offer. But how do we, how do we get that across, um, you know, the whole of government and those things, critical infrastructure and the, and the sectors that um, our nation is dependent upon? And so continuing, continuing to, do, to push down that road, both from an educational perspective, but also from an ability to share and, and, and work more collaboratively together is something I think we have to continue to work on. time to be with us this morning for missing the trip down from Fort Meade and the terrible weather. No problem. And, uh, good luck getting back. Again. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Very much appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.